right, there's a story I came across of a, a mom, 41-year-old Lydia Angu, uh, in 2006 in Alaska, in the winter of Alaska. Uh, she was taking her two little boys back home, and as they were passing the community center building, as they turned the corner, she looked to the right and she saw a 700-pound polar bear looking at her but more than her looking at her seven-year-old little boy. And the bear was running towards her son. Her son is frozen in fear. And the mom, her instincts kick in, and she jumps in front of her son. And the witnesses say she literally fought the bear, punching, kicking, scratching, and was fighting a 700-pound polar bear till someone saw who had a gun and shot the gun to scare the bear off. You know, that story um, is uh, a picture of, well, first of all, the polar bear messed with the wrong mama bear, right? Don't mess with the mama bear. We learned that. But it's a story of the willpower of the human being, that if a person is motivated by love, they could accomplish some wonderful, amazing things. They could gain strength, and they could fight off bears, and they could do these things if they are motivated by the right things. And so in that, we see a, the, the story, a picture of this willpower, someone who is able to do the impossible. And I share that with you today because we are called to live a life of integrity, of self-control. The psalmist here talks about this. And this isn't just about digging deep in yourself, but really it is the idea of where the motivation comes from. Just as that mother loved her child and was able, because of the love that she had, was able to stand and fight off a bear, you think about the greatest love of all that we have, the love of God through our Lord Jesus Christ towards us. And as we experience his love, and as we grow in his love, we now are able and we are motivated correctly to go and be changed, to grow in integrity, to have self-control, to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things, no matter how they appeal to us. And we can go against our own flesh. Um, and we see this here in this passage. This wonderful passage is a, is a story, it's a written by King David. Here is the king. And when we said king, it is uh, someone who is in absolute power, absolute authority, controls everything on a whim. Every word of his is like the word of God, and really the king is sovereign in this way. And though he controlled the king, the thing he says in Psalm 101 is that he now wants to tame and control himself. And he writes the psalm of living in integrity. And we're going to be taking a look at that today. You know, we are called to self-control. We are called to say yes to the right things and no to the ungodly things as the people of God. Not to become accepted by God, as religion would say, but because we have been accepted by God already. And it is out of that love that we can stand and do things that we might not be motivated to do, able to do, but we are capable because of the love that we have in God. And so this morning, I want to share with you just a little bit about that thought. Um, you know, in Titus 2, 11, it starts by talking about the grace of God, right, has appeared. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And what is the result of that grace is in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. The grace of God now changes us and allows us to be trained to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to say no to the things of this world and yes to the things of God. And so we see that here in uh, Titus 2, 11. Today we look at these commitments that are mentioned in Psalm 101. I broke it down in far, five parts and we'll run through that together this morning. And in it are commitments that we can say yes to, that we ought to commit to, that will lead us to now be trained in a righteous life. And then commitments that we should say no to, things that we ought to avoid and say no to. And anytime you are committed to something or someone, whether it is a program 
to finish at school or whether it's a workout program or whether it's a, it's a person that you are in love with. There are always things you have to say yes to and always things you have to say no to. And here as we try to walk in all integrity before God and, and the lives that we have here, uh, these are the commitments that are mentioned in Psalm 101. Number one, this is commitment one. I will sing to the Lord. This is the first commitment. Can you say that out loud with me one more time? One, two, three. I will sing to the Lord. Can we say it one more time as you are saying it to yourself as a commitment? One, two, three. I will sing to the Lord. This is a commitment that David makes in verse 1. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will sing. I will make music. This is his commitment. You see, music and singing is created by God to impact us, not just physically, but internally, our soul, our hearts. And we are moved. And scientists talk about how, boy, physiologically we are changed. And, you know, the dopamine and all the things that they talk about, all the things that change and the chemicals within us that are released and the endorphins and so on. But Singing has that effect. So you sing in a group, you sing at a ball game, you know, you go sing at a Norebang at night, and you're singing, and there you sing in the shower, you sing in the car, and there's something that changes us, you feel better. And singing has that effect, and we are created to have that desire, to have this practice of singing. So when we come to church and we have singing and music, it's not just the opening act for the talk or the sermon, but it's a time for us to sing along. Whether you sing as well, or you feel like I do not sing as well as Yvette or Bobby or Chris or whoever is up here, it is them serving us to now so that we could sing before God. And this is the commitment. I will sing. When we sing, it puts us in a posture of humility. When we sing praises to God, it is us telling God, you are God, you are king, I am not. Because when we do not worship and when we do not sing, our old tendency is to now worship ourselves, to lift up our own selves, and to forget who is on the throne. You know, it's interesting because singing is an, is an activity that brings the flesh and brings the soul or the heart together. It, in, it includes both, and it kind of our whole being is affected when we sing. It says in Psalm 84, the second part of verse 2, my heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. It's not just my voice, it's not just my vocals, it's not just my mouth, it's not just the sound, but it is my heart, it is impacted. And so when David says he will sing to the Lord, it is a spiritual discipline of him saying he will cultivate a sense of humility and awe gratitude as he sings he is training his own heart as he sings the body is training the heart the heart is being tra is training the body as we sing and andrew wilson said this uh, uh, i read this in an article that was written it says singing aligns the body the tongue the throat the chest the diaphragm the breath in the lungs the vibrations in the thorax with rejoicing in the soul by doing so reinforces it. By making a decision to sing with our bodies, we can lift our spirits and increase our joy. As John Ortberg says, I need to worship because without it, I can forget that I have a big God. I need to worship because without it, I forget his calling and begin to live in a spirit of self-preoccupation. I need to worship because without it, I lose a sense of wonder and gratitude and plot through life with blunders, blinders on. I need worship because my natural tendency is towards self-reliance and stubborn independence. So we need to worship. It's interesting that God uh, in 2 Corinthians had set aside even a group of people for the specific role of singing. In 2 Corinthians 20, verse 19, there's a group, the Korites, Korahites. Their sole job was to sing. And it says there, they stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So God creates all the different tribes and people groups. And within Israel, they all have roles. And the Korahites' role was to sing. And they were to sing loudly, not shy, not quiet, not meek, but they were to sing loud because it affected the spirit of all those who were around them. 
And so the commitment is there to sing. I will sing to the Lord. The second commitment is this. I will ponder the way. Can we say that out loud together? I will ponder the way. Ponder is to look upon. It's to look to gain wisdom. It's to learn how to live. It's not just musing on a thought. It's not just thinking about something nice and beautiful. But it is a truth that we think about, we meditate on, and it affects the decisions that we make. And so in this passage, I will ponder the way that is blameless. The King James translates that word ponder. I will behave myself wisely because it is something that leads to now my behavior, wisdom. It's a training of the mind. So let me encourage us. Our inspiration does not come from within. The world today says, look within yourself. Find your passions. Go after your passions. The world says, hey, find your pleasures. I'd be identified just by your own pleasures. And just be true to yourself in this way. But when we look within ourselves, we are self-contained. What are we going to learn? How are we going to be inspired? We find our inspiration from outside of us. And so what the Bible tells us is don't look within Don't meditate in the way that the world does, where they empty themselves and look for something within. No. Meditate on the blameless, the pure Word of God and on what He has done. Meditate on that. Ponder upon that. And let that truth sink in. So this is a yes. This is what I will do. This is a commitment that He makes. And so um, this idea that's mentioned here is also mentioned in when Joshua is now called to lead the people of God in Joshua 1.8, he says, The book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do. You will meditate on it. Something outside of yourself, outside of your own minds and outside of your own knowledge, you will meditate on an object outside of yourself, which is the book of the law, And so that you may be careful to do what it says. That it would lead to an action like this. This kind of meditation. um, On the way, on the word, on who Christ is. um, It not only informs us, but it directs our steps. So that is a yes that we must say, a thing we must say yes to. Commitment number three is I will walk with integrity. Right? Can we say that out loud? One, two, three. I will walk with integrity. When the Bible talks about walking, walking with God or your daily walk or walk with Christ or walk in the Spirit, walking means everyday life. Just you will live. It's talking about the Monday through Friday. It's talking about the packing the lunch for the uh, kids if you have kids or getting to work and sitting in traffic and the quality of work that you produce when it's time to work and how you rest, how you sleep. It's talking about just the everyday mundane little things. I will walk. And the psalmist here in verse 2, the second part says, I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. What David is saying is what I am in public will be who I am in private. I will not just deceive people in front of them. I will not be a hypocrite, but I will be real. And I will walk in this way at home, within my own house. Uh, Integrity here. It could be translated whole. It could be translated perfect, full, right? And so the picture he has is someone who on the outside seems a certain way, but at home they live a different type of life. No, they're whole, they're complete. There's a picture of a pie that uh, Gail King uh, posted, and she got it delivered, and she's asking people, did they scoop it wrong, or did someone eat half of it, and then they delivered it, right? And so people were discussing this online. It, either way, the best part of the pie is gone, right? That's the best part. This is like if you were a selfish sibling, you would eat that and then give the rest to your, you know, uh, your sibling. Here, have the rest. Right? It's like eating the muffin top and giving the bottom. Right? This is the best part. Um, and, and I share this silly illustration because it is like a life that is portrayed in one way. Maybe in your social media or maybe uh, in public, people see you a certain way, but at home you are different. 
It is how you live in this way that matters. It is N.T. Wright who says virtue is what happens when wise and courageous choices become second nature. As we live daily and as we choose to do what is right, choose what is correct before God, it becomes our second nature. That's where character is made as we practice daily in these things. Number four is a, a no, we must say, to commitment. It says this, I will not look at anything worthless. I will not look at anything worthless. Can we say that out loud? One, two, three. I will not look at anything worthless. It says in verse three, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Think of the things that we can see today. You know, back in the 70s, and some of us are around and grew up then and remember, they said the average adult saw uh, 500 ads a day back in the 70s. Um, but in order to see those ads, you better be outside driving or you've you got to have the TV on or the radio on or maybe have a magazine. Today, here's a challenge. The low end of the estimation is that the average adult today uh, is inundated by, and they see, uh, 5,000 ads a day. So whether you are watching highlights of the Dodgers game and all the ads that are popping up, whether you're scrolling through social media and all the ads that are popping up, you're driving down the street, things you don't even realize, the colors that are used, the billions of dollars that's put in to now stimulate us to go and now spend. And usually the message is, is your life's not good enough. You need to have this. You need to buy this. Think of how much better your life would be if you drove this car. Think of how much more pleasure you would have if you wore those clothes. Think of the attention you would receive if you bought these, you know, jewelry or whatever it is. And it, it's inundating us in this way. And it tells us here that I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. And let me just encourage us. Because our eyes are the gates to our hearts. We keep watching it. We keep setting that before us. And after a while, we will become materialistic more. We will now desire the things that we do not need. We will find it as insatiable, like, gosh, I really need those things. And if the world is now shooting 5,000 ads at us, we need some kind of discernment to say no. To say, I will not look. I will now focus on something positive. It is that much more difficult. And can you imagine in 10 years, it might be 20,000 ads. It might be playing and seeing all around us. Um, in ways that we don't even realize as technology grows and as the money there is used in this way. It is Charles Spurgeon who said, it is a tendency of things that are gazed at to get through the eyes into the mind and the heart. Uh, Aldous Huxley said that, the, that it describes this way, man's almost infinite appetite for distraction said we are, have an appetite for this. And so we watch what we watch. We say no to the things that are worthless uh, because it is like junk food before the real meal. It turns off our spiritual appetites. And we find or we try to find the things that we really need from the things that we do not need. And after a while, our souls are fatigued. Our hearts are full with things that we do not need in this way. Number five. This is the last of the commitments. I will walk with the faithful. Can we say that out loud? One, two, three. I will walk with the faithful. I will live with the faithful. I will befriend the faithful. I will associate myself with people. And here are kind of two parts. There are those we need to say no to and those we need to say yes to. Verse 5 describes those that... David says no to. Verse 6 describes those he says yes to. And verse 5 talks about now slanderers, arrogant. He will, they say, he will now keep them away. Verse 6 talks about those he will now approach and he will be with. 
And he says, I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, and they may, they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. It's a picture of David the king surrounding himself with those who are faithful. They will minister to him. They will serve him. They will be with him. And he says, I will surround myself with these types of people. It is in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that Paul tells us, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Those of you who have kids, when you send them off to school, whatever level that they go to, uh, probably the biggest prayer request is, I hope they find a good friend. Right? If they go the first day of, they go to preschool, if they find a friend, you know, that's good. The kid grows up and they get to junior high and kids, some kids get really influenced and you say, I hope they find some good friends, a good group. Because if they get surrounded by the wrong group, maybe they would succumb to some of these temptations. Maybe they would fall into some stupid acts and you say, I hope that they would do this. You know, isn't this the prayer for parents? And as they go off to high school and then to college and as they have this freedom and the prayer is, Boy, I, I hope they find some good Christian friends. I hope at church they could find some good Christian friends. I hope in the dorms they could find some good Christian fellowship. That would now direct them in this way. Because why? We all know the power of a people. We all know that the peer pressure and how strong that is. And there have been study after studies about this. The ancients talk about this. Uh, Aristotle talks about the three different types of friendships. He says there's a friendship based on utility. Utility is you go and get something from someone. You receive that. It's networking. It's business. You scratch my back, I scratch your back, and it's that. It's kind of the superficial friendship. The next level of friendship uh, is based on pleasure. Enjoyable friends. You have fun with these friends. You, do, you have hobbies together and you laugh together and that's a good thing. But the best, the deepest, is friendships based on virtue. People with whom you align yourself on the important things in life. And so even the ancient wisdom says this and you look at the scriptures and how true that is. It is C.S. Lewis who says that between friends you ask this question, do you see the same truth? As we gather today here, and as Pastor John talked about community groups, do we see the same truth? And we are so easily influenced by those who might not see the same truth that it skews our perspective on this. There was a, a book written called uh, Connected by Nicholas uh, Christakis from Yale and he talks about and he says these are so obvious that you know even though they did all this research to come up with these three fundamental truths he said these are so obvious and that we know but uh, research has proven that it's like this and he talks about the power of friends and how we are now how it affects us and number one friends strongly influence how you see yourself so those you are with determine your own self-esteem what not. And so if you have friends around you that listen to you, they think you're smart, they laugh at your jokes, you know, they, they ask you questions, ask you for advice, and they say, oh, you're pretty good, you're pretty smart, you're a good guy. That's how you perceive yourself. Because if you don't hear that, you don't know that. And we can doubt ourselves always. So uh, our own competence and uh, our own self-worth comes from the friends that we have. Secondly, your friends shape how you see the world. So if you are surrounded by people who are pessimists, um, boy, you know, just complaints, it'll be bad as well. You ever get to a restaurant and one person already says, oh my gosh, it was ter it, this is terrible. And they start by saying it, and even though you might have liked it towards the end, you say, oh, I guess it was terrible, right? Maybe I didn't know better. I, uh, my, it must have been really bad. I thought it was good, but I must have been really bad. And so it affects us in that way. Um, versus, let's say you're with someone uh, who is um, optimistic. And they say, this is great. What a wonderful day it is today. And you're like, yeah, it is a great day. 
You know, last week was 110. We had the AC. I don't know if you noticed last week. The AC only worked on this side, and it was heater on this side. I don't know if you noticed. I found out after that this side was broken, and so this side's fanning themselves. This side was like this, you know, and so it was back and forth. Um, on a hot day, those of you on this side, let me encourage you to sit on this side, right? Uh, run early if it's hot in case it doesn't work. But um, your friends shape how you see the world. Um, there's a, I uh, read an article by Dr. Alex uh, Leikerman, uh, uh, and he says that he learned in medical school that the one way to recognize that a patient is depressed is by examining our own mood once we finish interacting with them. If we feel depressed ourselves, there's a good chance um, the other person is depressed. To the point, if I sit and talk and I feel something at the end of it, most likely we are so influenced that, yeah, that person might even be depressed if it affects me in this way. Thirdly, friends, alter our desires. They change our desires. So you surround yourself with positive people. You surround yourself with people that say, oh, I love going to church, man. It's going to be great. And you, find, you catch yourself, yeah, yeah, I love going to worship. Man, worship is great. I can't wait to get to church. It's going to be a great day. And it can affect us in a positive way. I shared this in our uh, morning service um, about Pastor Sam. You know, Pastor Sam, uh, and I've known him um, for a long, long time. And it was almost 17 years ago when we were in the first year of our church. He or I got tickets to go watch the USC-Stanford game. And uh, this is when USC was doing so well, and uh, they were going to kill uh, Stanford, and it was going to be, we're going to see these future NFL players. So we went. He went to UCLA. He's a diehard uh, UCLA fan. So he'll probably be talking to some of you already about how, why UCLA is better than USC already this year, so on. He'll talk about that. Right? Um, he's diehard. He's not casual at all. So on the way there, he's saying, man, I hope Stanford wins. It'll be great, you know, if USC loses and all this. And then um, tight game. And USC, they've got the band, and they're playing their song. And then at a certain time, everyone gets up, and they're doing their little USC chants, right? I kid you not, at the end of the third quarter, I peek out of my peripheral vision. He is standing up with the student body, and he's doing this. <laughs> and I said, what are you, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, and then he's like, oh, he goes, nothing. And I brought it up today, and he denies it completely. <laughs> but I saw it. I saw it uh, first then. And if there was an iPhone or social media back then, it would have been up there. And I said, oh, my gosh, just three quarters being at a USC game, and your allegiance is changing already. You are putting up the victory sign. No, 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 no. And uh, um, so I remember putting that way back in my memory. That will be a good sermon illustration one day. And 17 years later, uh, I found it. This is what friendships do. Um, uh, Alexander Nehemiah says this, when we enter into a friendship, we were surrendering our future selves to, the to that relationship, in part because the friend may call forth parts of ourselves that don't yet exist. And this is the call of, the, of King David. The commitment. I will surround myself with the faithful. I will surround myself with the people of God. I will align myself with those who fear God in the same way that I do, who see the same truth, who say yes to the same God, who have experienced the gospel and the power of the gospel so much that they will now say, I align with these people. These are the friends of virtue that I have. And so this is a commitment for us. This is a prayer I want you to pray for your children. Not just to do well academically, not to excel in sports or any kind of activity. Those are all wonderful things. But to pray for their friends. Not to pray for the popular, oh, may they be included in the popular kids. Or just the smart kids only. But godly kids those who love God, those who love the church, love the people of God. You cannot discount a teenager's faith assuming, oh, they're so young. No, their faith 
oftentimes is way hotter, it's way stronger than ours. It now sets the tone for the rest of their lives and who they associate with now matters and it changes who we are today. And let me encourage you. Let us live this life that God has given to us as a woman, as a man of integrity. And we would find that all so successful of a life if we do so. You know, when we, as we are coming up to our church anniversary in a few weeks as we're going to celebrate, you know, I think about um, the beginning of our church and one of the commitments I remember sharing, and this has been in our DNA, is that our church, the success of ministry for me is not just the number of people or the invitations or becoming famous or whatever. No, it's a place where my own family experiences the love of God and where dad, pastor, dad, the same at home. And that was almost fearful. And I'll, be, I'll just share it. I'll just confess a little bit. It was really fearful. Because when we were growing up in our generation, uh, there was a stereotype of PKs or pastor's kids. And we would joke and say, oh, the PKs, they're the rebels, right? They're the ones that falls away. They're the ones that cause trouble because there is inconsistency maybe at home. And that was a prayer of mine. And somehow by God's grace, and we see it throughout we see it with our other pastors who have been here for faithfully for so long. And you see, when you are together, and many of us have been together for years and years, and when you are together and you're sitting in, in living rooms and talking and doing life, you cannot hide or impress anyone any longer. We are brothers and sisters. We are like family. And you see the real person of who they are. And this is something that is coming true. And I am grateful uh, for that and the measure of success uh, is gauged by those things and so we as a people of God who are tremendously loved you are defined as John is defines himself as the one Jesus loved you are the beloved people may that be your motivation may the grace of God be your motivation May the truth that you are accepted by God be the motivation to now help you to fight and to say yes to the things that matter, to say no to the things that are worthless, and to live a life every day, a life of integrity, empowered by God, through him, for him, unto him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you give us this life to live. You give us the freedom to choose. And God, our flesh is often stronger than the Spirit is willing. And yet, Lord God, when we think about the gospel and we think about the love that you have lavished upon us in Christ, that we as your beloved people, all of a sudden, God, our motivation is there. Because of who we are in you, we want to live for you. So would you give us now the strength daily to say yes to you, to sing to you, to say yes to the people and the fellowship we have here, to say no to the things that are worthless, say no to the things of this world, but to say yes to you. God, you know, you know how weak we are. You know how easily we are swayed. It doesn't take even 5,000 ads for us to be changed sometimes. But your word is powerful. The gospel is power for us. When we sing to you, it empowers us, God. So we are gathered here today for that truth. Help us to live that out, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.